And th I think this is part of why mastering is so um, sort of cloaked in a shroud of mystery for for a lot of people because questions like that don't have one answer. We are here with Rachel Field and we are going to answer the age old question. What the fuck is mastering? So we have an expert here, an incredible mastering engineer who's going to talk to us today about what is mastering and kind of demystify it for us. So, Rachel, what the fuck is mastering? Uh, well, first, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, appreciate that. And mastering. So at mastering's base, the bottom line of mastering is uh, preparing audio, preparing music for, for commercial release. One of the goals is to optimize the audio for playback across multiple systems and different platforms. It's not just, oh, we make it louder. Cause I think that's what people always think that mastering is just volume. So, so it's not just, you make it louder. There's more that goes into it. It is correct there. It is not just make it louder. Um, although that, that has become one of the, you know, primary goals in a lot of cases in commercial release that mastering is where the final loudness is set. Uh, and so, so making it louder is usually something that happens during the processing, though not always. So other than making it loud, how does it prepare your song? Like I've, I've, I've heard, I've hear it. Like I listen to before and afters and you hear the difference and you go, yeah. Oh yeah, that does sound better. But what are the, 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 like the difference between just a loud mix and a professional mastering engineer putting their touch on it? So that, and I think this is part of why a mastering is so, um, sort of cloaked in a shroud of mystery for, for a lot of people, because questions like that don't have one answer. Uh, there is no there just is not like one set answer to most questions about mastering because uh, what happens to any given song or mix or project is gonna vary based on what the audio is like when it comes in and what the overall goal of the artist and producer is in the end as well, as well as uh, the formats and, and platforms it's being released in. But to, to try to answer your question and, and with the caveat that everything is prefaced with sometimes yeah <laughs> the things that can happen in the mastering process um, are tonal balancing sometimes corrective eq a lot of people like to say that there is more air in a master or there can be and sometimes more detail becomes apparent and and that's achieved by a number of ways that can be unmasking or um, utilizing like a, a fair amount of analog gear that I utilize for tone shaping quite a bit. The processing includes all the same things, all the same tools you have in recording and mixing, right? You have EQ, you have compression, you have limiting, you have DSing, you have all the same tools, but here in the mastering process, all those tools are utilized a little bit differently because they're applied to the entire mix rather than any individual track with the goal of optimizing and um, creating a sense of consistency throughout a project. So if you have a, a project of 10 songs and let's say you get 10 mixes in, if you apply the same settings to all 10 songs, you might not get a consistent result. Mm -hmm. So each song is fine tuned individually with different settings to sort of bring the continuity and, and make the 10 songs feel like an album together. Nice, nice. And then um, I've heard something about um, how in the masters, sometimes people like encode for the copywriting purposes. Is there like an encoding in masters when you get it done with a professional instead of like trying to do it yourself or go with one of them services? Are you talking about ISRCs possibly? I think so. Yeah. It's like people have asked me about it and I'm like, Phew, right over the head. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. Um, ISRC codes can be encoded into WAV files. Traditionally, they, that has not been a standard MO. 
what gets delivered to the digital distri distributor um, can can vary. I guess what what every mastering engineer gives you to pass on to your digital distributor can vary depending on your mastering house. My preference is to deliver 16-bit 44.1 wave files, and then from there, the files are generate they're distributed, and then the final files that are getting actually streamed or actually distributed are generated and encoded from there. So that's not in my hands. Okay. Um, so most of that, um, like ID tags are not, uh, most of that information is not necessarily something that's normally included in a WAV file because officially speaking, WAV files don't carry metadata and they can't carry all the same metadata that an MP3 can, mm -hmm. but I don't want to deliver right. a crappy loss, lossy product to distribution that is then also going to get, you know, watered down again with their processing. Right, right. So that would be something that a distributor or a label or something like that would put in for you. That's not necessarily what your mastering engineer does. Yes. It, well, some mastering houses will, can and will do that. And it's just a, a conversation you need to have. It, it's most commonly done at the distributor phase. I think it's important to know that for digital commerce tracking, ISRCs are necessary and they are probably not in your files unless you, you have that specific confirmation from your mastering engineer. So the way I run it is I don't encode them unless they're provided to me. I don't generate them, but I can encode them. And the, I think the reason why it's important is becoming important uh, is because there are initiatives to start making that a more ubiquitous you know, MO utilizing the ability to put ISRCs into wave files um, for things like radio play or um, other types of services that are streaming your music so that it can be tracked for revenue purposes. Awesome. That was a very clear, uh, great answer. I've I've been curious about that for a while and I was like, oh, I should just ask Rachel the next time I talk to her. <laughs> Cause I've had people ask because they're like, well, if I want this or that, and I'm like, yeah, I don't uh, call a mastering engineer. I don't know, but it's nice to like have all that information available for for clients yeah. and things like that. And I'll I'll just add really quickly, I, I think it's less of a big deal if they're not in your wave files. Um, as long as you know they're not in your wave files so that when you're sending your wave files to a radio station or whatever, you're aware of that. Um, but if you have MP3s made, you should definitely get them into your MP3s mm -hmm. somehow. Most people release their stuff to like Spotify or Apple Music and a lot of streaming services. So those masters are, you know, what your mastering produce can totally be uploaded to there or made into CDs. But there is a lot of um, people wanting to do vinyl. Do you have to get a vinyl specialist for mastering? Because I have heard also that that if you if you want vinyl, you should talk to a mastering engineer who does vinyl. Is that correct? Um, okay, so I'm going to break this into two responses. One is about the digital distribution versus CD okay. audio. And I actually have recently started providing slightly different audio for each. So that is definitely something you want to confirm and have a conversation with your mastering engineer about just to make sure you're delivering the correct audio for each platform or each um, medium that you're, you're manufacturing. Uh, and that does also go for vinyl. Um, so I am not a lacquer cutting engineer, but I do prepare audio for lacquer cutters um, pretty frequently, actually. That has really kicked up in the last couple of years, which is awesome. I would say it is not necessarily true that you need to have a vinyl expert preparing the audio for the vinyl, for the lacquer cutting engineer. But it is my stance that working with a chosen, experienced lacquer cutting engineer directly, rather than just shipping off to a pressing plant without knowing who's cutting it, mm -hmm. uh, is definitely the more optimal way to go if, if that's available and feasible for you. Great. That's uh, awesome. And so then just, just like always talking with your mastering engineer about 
your project because every stage of the process varies between person to person and, and manufacturer to manufacturer. And so having that direct line of communication is really important. Um, so like I have a, a couple of cutting engineers that I work with pretty regularly and I have them as a resource that you know we, we can communicate directly and make sure what I'm providing is optimized for them. Awesome. Yeah, I might have to get uh, a, a lacquer cutter engineer on the show at some point. Yeah, I think that's just like there's there's so many steps and, you know, you got your musician, you got your guitar and you're going to sing and you're like, OK, I'm going to put music out and yeah. <laughs> it's just like so much. And you're like, I got audacity. I'm going to do this, you know, but there's like so many steps in the process. And that's kind of why I've like wanted to have this series is mostly for cool. the musicians that get into the process and they don't know what the next step who should i go to for this what should i do yeah. here and um even it even varies from like if you're a you know a hip-hop artist you don't want to go to a engineer who uh mixes metal and it's same kind of with mastering engineers you know you don't want to you, you got to know the right people to fit your project so that's definitely good advice is just as much communication as you possibly can have with all the people along the way in the process because you don't want to get to the end of your project and your masters are delivered and you're like okay well now i've decided i want vinyl or i want cd or i want you know this or that and then you have to go back and re-get different things and, and do different things. So thanks for talking about the, the communication aspect of it. Yeah, definitely. And and the way I work here, and I imagine it's a fairly common um, sort of scenario, though I can't speak for all mastering houses, but <laughs> if you don't know you're doing vinyl the day I'm mastering your project, that's okay. We can still prepare that for you afterward. Mm -hmm. And that's that goes for CD preparation and and cassette preparation even. Um, so, oh, cassette is that coming okay back? To not know cassette <laughs> is that is cassette coming back? That's, there's kind of an underground cassette thing going on. <laughs> for uh, for those of you who are um, not in your 30s and 40s and 50s, <laughs> cassette is uh, when when you when we were little kids, you <laughs> you put it in the stereo and you hit record. You record the radio, so that that was your uh, original streaming service, right there. That's right, the original pirating. Yeah, the original pirating. Split <laughs> <laughs> the cassette, and then if it broke, you put a pencil in it. Yeah, uh, bring it up. God, I haven't, and, I haven't seen and it. God take. forbid it got eaten in your car stereo. Oh, yeah. Or you had the, the portable CD player and then you'd put the you'd have it plug into the earphone jack and then you push the tape in. Oh, yeah. Play like the CD through the tape cassette. I remember those. Yeah, that's old school. Now I'm really I'm dating myself right now, but <laughs> I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> Before you go, why yeah. is it important? to get your songs mastered because a lot of musicians want to say, you know what, I'll just skip that process and I'm done. I think if you want to be sure that when your songs are released, that they fit well among other released material in the commercial setting that, um, you know, aligns with your genre. I think that's probably the most important reason why um, having one last set of ears from someone who does, that's what they do all day, every day, and they are not super invested in your project already. Um, so having sort of a, an unbiased, fresh set of ears listen and make some decisions. And, um, and the other thing is having another person in another space on another monitoring system, just give a listen and check everything over. There is often, the opportunity there to catch things that are still correctable that have made it all the way through the process to that point before they actually get released. Yeah. And then you can talk back to the mix engineer and say, Hey, you need to cut this yeah, sometimes, says, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, but also, you know, I, and this might not be a popular opinion among professional mastering engineers, but if you can't afford it or you just straight up don't want to like, don't let it stop you from releasing your music, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm in that camp too. I tell people all the time. It's like, you know, don't let, don't let money stop you from putting your art out into the world and, um, and doing the things that you love. And same here, you know, I, I work with people all the time. I set up payment plans and, and all kinds of stuff to just encourage people to get their music out there. And, uh, yeah, just keep, keep putting out art. And one day you get enough streams, you can go get it fancy mastered. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, if we wanted to have super awesome, punchy, loud bastards and we wanted to hire you for that, how do we find you, Rachel? I am pretty easy to find. I have a website for the studio that is resonantmastering.com. And there is a contact form on the site. Uh, I also have a personal website, rachelfieldaudio.com. Um, where there's more information about me specifically um, in and outside of this studio. You know, I'm all over the Facebook and Insta- probably more Instagram than Facebook anymore, but um, it's Rachel Field Audio there also. So just Google and, you, type your name in, you'll find you. Well, actually, you'll get an author. There's an author named Rachel Field. And so oh. you'll just have to scroll past her stuff and then I'll be in there somewhere. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. So just make sure you put but, the audio part. Yeah. And not audiobook. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Don't put the book part. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and demystifying a little bit. It's it's just one of those topics that I don't think it'll ever be completely demystified until you as a person get in and start mastering and moving stuff around and touching the buttons and going through the process yourself. Um, I think and, that's true. Yeah. It's just kind of like a hands-on, it's like mysterious mystery. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And, yeah. Thanks uh, for having me, Jim. Yeah. All right. If you enjoyed this interview, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be putting out these interviews once a week for the next few months, so if you enjoy them, please hit the like button, leave a comment. It really helps out the channel. Appreciate you.